It's called the sport of kings. You do have to have a king's ransom to keep a horse in training. And for years, it was ruled by a family dynasty. They were the most feared, the most well-financed. Nobody else compared. Then, an ambitious farmhand marries into the family. The result is disastrous. He wanted power, and, and Calumet was the symbol of that, the ultimate symbol of power. And maybe deadly. To this day, people believe there was a big conspiracy. When a champion racehorse has to be put down, is it mercy or murder? Find out tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Thursday, November 15th, 1990, 8.15 a.m. Veterinarians arrive at legendary Calumet Farm in Lexington, Kentucky. There, they find champion thoroughbred Aladar collapsed in his stall. His right hind leg hideously mangled. After loading a syringe with a fatal dose of barbiturates, vets put the world's most valuable horse to sleep. Before it was over, the investigation of Aladar's death would involve much more than the passing of a champion racehorse. It would involve the greedy schemes of a poor farmer's son muscling his way into the world of Kentucky bluegrass aristocracy. The Keeneland horse auctions in Lexington, Kentucky attract the rich and royal from around the world. When the Learjets touch down at Lexington's Bluegrass Airport, it signals the beginning of a buying spree that can empty the pockets of millionaires. Buyers pay millions of dollars for untried uh, colts. And so there was a feeling that there was no limit. And let's go for it. A single horse with the right bloodline can go for five, ten, even fifteen million dollars. Behind the cascade of dollars is the dream of glory. The dream that one of these thoroughbreds will become a champion. The stakes are high, and so are the odds. You can use smart management techniques and still lose. In fact, the great joke says the best way to take a million out of the horse game is start with a hundred million. But first, you have to have a hundred million. And amid the lush and spectacular horse farms that dot the bluegrass hills around Keeneland, there are plenty of people who do. When they're not raising and racing horses, they're raising cocktail glasses on a high society party circuit that rivals Palm Beach and the Hamptons. Lexington combines the races with the social season and it carries through from the opening day of Keeneland in April to the Kentucky Derby, which is in Louisville. For more than 100 years, it's been a world of money, glamour, and glory, reserved for the lucky few who, like their horses, were born with the right bloodlines. It was the kind of world that a poor sharecropper's son like J.T. Lundy could only dream about. But J.T. Lundy wasn't content with dreaming. He wanted in, and before he was done, he would bring that world to its knees. I think Lundy wanted something better, wanted to be part of the inner circle, the gleaming uh, white uh, fences and uh, beautiful barns that were part of the fabled Lexington uh, bluegrass aristocracy. At the very top of that aristocracy was the world's most prosperous thoroughbred farm, Calumet. Calumet was the crown jewel of horse racing. Its horses had won racing's greatest prizes, two triple crowns and eight Kentucky Derbies. It's the second triple crown for Calumet Farms and the second for Eddie Arcaro. Calumet was the quintessential horse farm. There, there was nobody who did it any better. Uh, 
Uh, you can compare it with with the New York Yankees. The farm citation was racing's first million dollar horse. The Wright family who owned the farm controlled a fortune that exceeded 100 million dollars. They were the most feared, the most well financed, the most talented. Right on down the line, nobody else compared. The white fences, the bluegrass, the devil's red, the buildings, they're such uh, class. And from the 1950s to the 1980s, much of that class came from the farm's matriarch, Lucille Wright Markey. And Mrs. Markey was a very unique lady. She came from an era where women wore white gloves and dinner parties and luncheons and formal parties were part of their life. High society's top tier, the Ardens, the Whitney's, and Prince Ali Khan were all frequent guests of Lucille's at Calumet. She was considered one of these social butterflies. I mean, she knew all of the big names in the business. Lucille held fast to the traditions of a more genteel time and made sure that Calumet remained a steadfast symbol of Southern wealth and class. She just was a very classy person that came from an era where class was, and, and gentility were, you know, were part of form. And, and without that, you just didn't belong. Having grown up down the, down the road from Calumet and passed by it on my way to school every day, and it was just one of the icons of the thoroughbred industry. It's not surprising that many locals grew up with dreams of making their mark at Calumet. The combination of classy horses and classy folk at Calumet drew the attention of a young J.T. Lundy. Though far from a Kentucky blue blood, J.T.'s passion was thoroughbreds. He was a country type of a horseman. He was not a refined horseman. He knew his way around a horse. He knew his way around a farm. His big dream, his obsession, was to run Calumet. But he was such a long way from, you know, drinking juleps uh, on, on the porch. But yet he had these dreams. Uh, he was going to get there somehow. The idea of a blue-collar guy like J.T. Lundy ever getting control of a blue-blood institution like Calumet Farm was a long shot. But Lundy wanted it so badly he could taste it. And he found a way to improve the odds. In the summer of 1962, 21-year-old J.T. Lundy met 16-year-old Cindy Wright through a mutual friend. Wright was Lucille Markey's granddaughter. He told people early on he was going to marry Cindy and run Calumet. She was his ticket. Lundy saw his opening. He dropped out of school to court Cindy full time. JT Lundy loved getting places fast. And I think he saw a shortcut to getting to the top of Calumet. Over her grandmother's loud and adamant protests, the couple eloped in 1963. The new Mrs. Lundy may have been the only person in Kentucky not suspicious of her husband's motives. He had married Sandy to get in position, waiting for Mrs. Markey to die so that he would become the manager of Calumet Farm. But Lundy was a tempestuous soul prone to loud outbursts and tirades. JT was not a polished individual. He was considered crude. He never wore a suit and tie. Uh, he, was a, he was a good old boy. Uh, he would rather go down here and eat fried chicken than go to the country club and play golf. Lundy may have lacked sophistication, but he didn't lack ambition. He immediately began grooming himself to take over Calumet and wasn't afraid to let people know it. He says, Margaret, I'm going to take my trainer's exam today. I said, what for, JT? You're not going to be a trainer. He said, well, if you're going to run Calumet Farm, you've got to know everything there is to know about a horse. But Lucille Markey refused to allow JT and Cindy to have anything to do with Calumet. She thought they were 
like the Be Beverly Hillbillies and didn't want to have them around uh, with her fancy friends. Undaunted, JT borrowed money to purchase his own farm, a 318-acre breeding and boarding operation just up the road from Calumet. He was willing to bide his time, knowing that eventually Calumet would pass to the family he had married into. For two decades, Lundy tracked Calumet's every move and waited for Lucille to die. Meanwhile, Lucille Markey's Calumet continued to be a force in the thoroughbred industry, culminating in 1978 with the rise of a remarkable Calumet cult named Aladar. But as they're nearing the finish, it's Aladar just drawn away with the lead with every stride under the wire. Aladar very easy. He was a majestic uh, individual. He, he really had kind of a regal bearing about himself, and, and he looked the part uh, that, that he filled. Aladar was a bluegrass celebrity. His rivalry with the firm had made history in that year's Triple Crown races. It probably produced some of the greatest racing that we've ever seen in America. Uh, I mean, it, it was a national phenomenon to watch those, those two go at each other. Though his rival won the Triple Crown, Aladar had no rivals when it came to fathering champions. Big, beautiful yearlings by Aladar were showing up at the sales and they were running well and they were just so good looking that everybody thought, boy, this one can't miss. Lucille charged a $40,000 stud fee to owners who wanted their mares to spend a few minutes in Aladar's breeding shed. So far, Lucille Markey had managed to not only keep Calumet among the top farms, but also keep her granddaughter's husband, J.T. Lundy, out of the family business. But Lucille was 90 years old. It was only a matter of time before JT got his chance. On July 24th, 1982, Calumet's longtime matriarch Lucille Markey succumbed to bronchial pneumonia at the age of 93. Family and friends were devastated. J.T. Lundy was elated. J.T. harbored great, great resentments um, against his wife's grandmother. And the story was that after Mrs. Markey's funeral, he stayed around to urinate on her grave. Curiously, none of Lucille Markey's heirs wanted anything to do with running a horse farm. And J.T. knew it. It didn't take him long to persuade the family to let him take the reins of an operation worth nearly $100 million. The Wright family were not only not horse people, they weren't really familiar with any type of business or how a business should be conducted. The family was busy with their own affairs and they didn't want to be bothered with all the details. Almost immediately, JT initiated sweeping changes to the farm's operation. JT came into his operation at Calumet Farm with a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, that he wanted to show the establishment in Kentucky, which he was not part of, that he could be part of it. When JT took over uh, as head of Calumet Farm, I, I knew that he was going to come in and kind of sweep everybody out the door. We didn't fit into their plans. <laughs> Naturally, they wanted to get rid of us as soon as possible. JT also launched into a flurry of high-stakes ventures. To improve Calumet's breeding operations, JT bought and sold dozens of horses. For a single unproven stallion, he spent $25 million. Before long, he had over 100 Calumet horses racing at myriad tracks across the country. Calumet was the conservative bastion of the establishment. They did everything by the book for years and years and years. Since J.T. Lundy took over the manager's role, he had a uh, much more uh, cash flow minded, aggressive idea of management. He, of course, immediately increased the prices of the stud fees, which shut a lot of people out. But he wanted full control. 
Lundy's unconventional practices didn't win him friends in the industry, but JT didn't care. Because he not only controlled the most successful farm, he also controlled the nation's most celebrated thoroughbred. Seven-year-old stallion Aladar was not only famous, he was Calumet's most valuable asset. The Queen of England had called JT to have one of her mares bred to him. He was at the top of the rankings of, of sires worldwide. Aladar was also the foundation of Lundy's plans for Calumet. JT raised Aladar's stud fee from 40,000 to a stunning 250,000. And for 2.5 million, he offered lifetime breeding rights, a very rare practice in the thoroughbred world. Selling a lifetime breeding right, you're not selling any equity, but a person can breed one mare every year, forever. It's a good way to get cash flow in your pocket. To protect his investment, he insured Aladar with Lloyds of London and other agencies. Overall, he had more than $30 million in life insurance policies on the horse. Policies he hoped he would never need. By 1983, thanks in large part to Aladar's stud fees, Lundy was flush with cash, but he didn't hold on to it for long. He began an ambitious remodeling campaign, including a million dollar aquatic facility. He also renovated the estate's manor house. Tremendous amount of money spent on the facility, house refurbished, barns refurbished. It was a totally different atmosphere than it had been. Uh, when the farm was still under Ms. Markey. Lundy also had ornate 15-foot-high iron entrance gates installed at Calumet. Once JT Lundy installed those gates, it was like they shut the world out. There were times when breeders would say, oh, I'd like to come out and see the stallions. Well, if it wasn't convenient for JT, then they didn't get to come in and see them. Lundy spent lavishly on himself, too. He bought a ski villa in Vail, a condominium in the Florida Keys, and a home in the Virgin Islands. He purchased a fleet of aircraft, including a $2.1 million eight-passenger West Wind jet. To realize a childhood dream of racing cars, JT spent over $100,000 of Calumet's money to sponsor A.J. Foyt's IndyCar team. He jetted around a lot of places, he entertained a lot of people, and he, he really had a a good time uh, and just burned through a huge amount of money. It was uh, an image thing, a, a power thing. JT would fly friends up to Maine for uh, a lobster picnic, you know, it just, or he would just go anywhere at a whim. By the mid 80s, Calumet's cash reserves were spent. Using the farm and Aladar as collateral, Lundy secured loans from several Kentucky banks. They had a great, great uh, endless stream of money. They were courted by every bank. And JT took the banks up on their offers. He kept on spending and kept on borrowing. He kept borrowing from one bank to pay back another and then borrowing from yet another bank to pay back that bank. These banks thought they were buying into a gold mine. They just didn't know somebody else already owned it. In 1988, JT once again was strapped for cash. But this time, the Kentucky bank said enough. He was not a business-minded person, but he leveraged everything on the farm. And that's what we were hearing in the industry. And it was frightening. Through a mutual friend in the breeding business, Lundy met a banker in Texas named Frank Shehack. Shehack was vice chairman of Houston's First City National Bank and shared Lundy's passion for horse racing. They became associated with each other because A, uh, Lundy and Calumet was obviously a business uh, dealing with, uh, with horse racing and B, Frank Shehack was in control of a very large financial institution. Shehack lent Lundy $50 million. Now, wait a minute. Here's a guy who three years earlier didn't have two nickels to rub together. 
Now he's convincing a Texas banker to loan him millions of dollars on a farm that's already mortgaged to the hilt. Something fishy was going on here. When we return, Lundy goes to desperate measures to save Calumet. On September 20th, 1989, J.T. Lundy received a six-page memorandum from Gary Matthews, Calumet's chief financial officer. According to Matthews, the farm was $100 million in debt and dangerously behind on loan and insurance payments. For seven years, J.T. Lundy had enjoyed power and riches beyond his wildest dreams. Now, thanks to his mismanagement and colossal overspending, the once mighty Calumet farm was going down the tubes. Desperate for cash, Lundy again turned to Frank Shehack and Houston's first city national bank. Although he already owed them $50 million, Shehack loaned Lundy millions more and restructured Calumet's payment plan. It looks like Calumet might be saved. But in October 1990, under investigation by the FBI for fraud, Shehack suddenly resigned. The loans that we looked at that Chiak were involved in were all questionable. They always seemed to go bad. The bank's new management threatened to foreclose on Calumet, giving Lundy only four months to come up with $15 million in interest payments. To make matters worse, one of Aladar's insurance carriers announced that they were tired of being stiffed by Lundy and would not renew the horse's $5 million policy. J.T. Lundy was up against the wall. They had uh, used up all the cash flow there. They got them painted themselves in a corner where they had nothing else to sell. On the evening of November 13th, 1990, Calumet's night watchman made the usual rounds. When he walked behind the farm's main office to Aladar's barn, he noticed a metal bracket was broken off of Aladar's stall door. Inside, he made an alarming discovery. The stallion lay on the floor, his right hind leg badly injured. J.T. Lundy and Calumet's veterinarians arrived on the scene in minutes. Tom Dixon, an insurance adjuster, arrived shortly after 10 p.m. We had a bad, bad injury on our hands, but we're standing there looking at the world's leading stallion. And we're thinking about, uh, uh, what can we do to save this horse? How bad is it? Lundy seemed genuinely upset and called Dr. Larry Bramlage, Lexington's world-renowned equine surgeon. And Mr. Lundy was obviously disturbed. His voice was cracking on the phone. And um, even though we described the scenario as being a very bleak prognosis, uh, his words were, but this is Ali Dar, and we, we have to try. Lundy claimed Aladar had a bad temperament and frequently kicked his stall door. He alleged the horse had caught his leg in the door and snapped it as he struggled to get free. He had a fracture and he did have a hole in his skin with uh, the point of one of the bones sticking out. And that's bad in people, but it's doubly bad in horses. The stricken prize-winning stud was sedated and Bramlage agreed to try surgery. We actually got the surgical uh, procedure done in fairly short order. We basically used the area of his wound to insert a small plate, and then we put some pins across his bone and incorporated them in a fiberglass cast. At first, the horse did well. He was fully conscious. Everything went great. He just dropped his head and started eating. Everybody's spirits got really high and said, oh, you know, another hurdle that we've gotten over. Bramlage and Dixon left the barn relieved. They didn't get far. Dr. Bramlage had left, but had only gotten down to the gate of the farm. And they got him on his telephone, turn around, quick, Doc, Aladar's got a problem. Aladar had fallen again. He tried to, 
to move across the stall and slipped and fell with the cast on and he had fractured this time the bone in his thigh. With a second fracture in the same leg, they were out of options. They were waiting for my final okay because I was there representing the insurance companies. They said, well, we've only got one choice. I said, well, let's do it. As the horse lay there in his stall in obvious pain, the mighty champion Aladar was put down. It's just a matter of giving them an overdose of anesthetic. Um, they just sleep away. On November 15th, 1990, Aladar was buried on a hill overlooking Calumet's white fences and rolling fields. News of his death rocked the thoroughbred world. Anytime a stallion in the prime of life of his magnitude, dying young, relatively young like that, um, that does create quite a jolt to the thoroughbred community. I mean, it was a top priority story. It was the biggest news that week and probably the biggest news of the year. Hot on the heels of the news came the rumors. Suspicion started almost from day one that uh, it was not as reported that uh, it had been killed for the insurance money. Aladar's death was, of course, shrouded with mystery. I think that it was such a shock to the community. People said, well, how could this have happened? Not long after the last shovel of dirt was put on Aladar's grave, Lundy was filing insurance claims. And rumors about Calumet's troubles and Lundy's desperation started to swirl through the Kentucky hills. When we come back, federal agents try to penetrate the insular world of thoroughbred racing to uncover the truth about what really happened to Aladar. It was December of 1990, one month after the death of Aladar. J.T. Lundy had filed insurance claims totaling over $30 million. It was money he desperately needed to keep the banks from foreclosing on Calumet. Believe it or not, despite the rumors, the suspicious timing, and J.T.'s reputation as an opportunist, the insurance companies paid out within a month. I ask people three things when they come up with their theories. Were you there the night the horse injured himself? Were you there the morning we did the surgery? Were you there when we put the horse down? Now, if you can't say yes to all three of those, you don't know what you're talking about. The payout totaled a staggering $36.5 million, the largest ever thoroughbred insurance settlement. The money enabled Lundy to make the $15 million payment First City Bank of Houston was demanding, as well as keep some other creditors at bay. But without the cash Aladar was bringing in, it wasn't long before Lundy again found himself in financial trouble. We reviewed the books. We saw there were just no money, no cash flow. On April 3rd, 1991, J.T. Lundy abruptly resigned as president of Calumet and left Lexington for good. It was like Mr. Lundy threw his hands up and said, I quit, you know, wasn't my fault. But whose fault was it? It looked like the story of J.T. Lundy and Calumet was over. But Aladar's ghost would haunt Lundy for the next decade. On July 11th, just three months after Lundy abandoned it, Calumet, the world's most storied thoroughbred farm, filed for bankruptcy. The horses were sold, and plans were made to auction the 830-acre estate. Before JT took over, the farm had $93 million in assets. And then by the time the farm files for bankruptcy in 91, a little over a decade later, the farm is $165 million in the hole. You can sum it up in one word for the tragedy of Calumet Farm, and that was stupidity. I mean, you can throw in there a little bit of greed, uh, certainly some horrible business decisions. J.T. Lundy and the Wright family heirs, once among Kentucky's wealthiest, were all bankrupt. 
Cindy Lundy filed for divorce. They totally trusted him to handle their affairs. And unfortunately, they went down with him. By 1996, J.T. Lundy was nearly homeless. He did go to Florida, and, and people would see him around the Ocala area. Supposedly, he was living in a barn tack room. Living in a barn wouldn't be the worst of Lundy's problems. That year, the feds reopened their investigation into the shenanigans at First City Bank. Among them, the huge unsecured loans to J.T. Lundy. It looked strange, and, and on the surface it looked like, why would, why would a Texas bank make a, a big loan like that to a, a horse farm in Kentucky? U.S. attorneys Julia Hyman Tomala and James Powers were determined to find out. While digging into First City's records, one name kept coming up. Aladar. When we looked into um, Calumet Farm, we determined it was approximately $50 million that she had caused to be made. And the main collateral for that loan was Aladar. They made no significant payments on this $50 plus million dollar debt since it uh, was funded in 1988. And then in 1991, they made a huge payment. It turned up that it came from the insurance proceeds from the uh, death of Aladar. The deeper investigators dug, the more questions they had. Circumstantial evidence pointed strongly towards the fact that the horse was intentionally injured. And the person who would gain, would benefit from that would be Lundy. Finally, it looked like the feds were onto Lundy's tricks. And I don't care who you are, the last people you want looking into your past are federal investigators. When we return, just as it looks like prosecutors have Lundy on the ropes, he appears to once again get away. In the summer of 1997, federal investigators traveled to Lexington looking for leads on the mysterious death of Aladar. Investigators were determined to prove Aladar's death was a desperate act of murder. But they were frustrated that not everybody saw it their way. There was a question as to whether it's possible that someone could have purposely created the fracture in Aladar's limb. And I didn't believe then, nor do I believe today, that that's the case. I think it was a stall accident. The government seemed to be convinced that uh, J.T. Lundy had killed the horse for the insurance money. And if he was involved in anything like that, that night he should get the Oscar and the Emmy in one night. I mean, if he was putting on, he was doing a good job of it. With locals disputing their allegations, the feds turned to an outside expert, MIT professor Dr. George Pratt. I mean, my basic conclusion is the bracket found in the aisle was a plant. If Aladar had sheared those bolts by a kick them inside the stall, the lip of metal would have been pointing towards the outside of the stall. In reality, the lip of metal was pointing more or less into the stall. Pratt's report concluded that Aladar's injury couldn't have been the result of kicking. We did a calculation on the force that would be required to shear those bolts off. So horse couldn't do it. This was not a flimsy door. That Pratt and investigators had a pretty good idea how Aladar's injury could have occurred. Someone might have uh, put a rope around the back leg, put it out through the stall, the grating in the stall door, and pulled his leg up and made the horse fall. Many vets told me that a horse with a spiral fracture like that to Aladar's leg had been hit by a truck. So. It's obvious that he didn't simply kick the stall door. Something else happened. While there were several theories, they were all mere speculation. There's really no direct evidence of the injury itself because everything had been destroyed. With little else to go on, investigators again traveled to Kentucky to try to find someone who would talk. Finally, they located Alton Stone, 
the night watchman on duty the night of Aladar's injury. He was, he was working construction in Ardstown, Kentucky, and I told him who I was. The way, he, the way he looked, the way he reacted, you could tell there was something he was hiding. During his interview, Stone revealed some troubling facts. We came to find out that he was not even supposed to be working that night. Why Alton Stone was there instead of Harold Kipp, the regular night watchman, uh, really became suspicious. Agents also caught Stone in a lie. Alton made a, such a point that he was the one that found Aladar. The horse was sweating, was uh, in distress, and, and it was very dramatic the way he described it. And yet, later, we find out, in fact, Alton was not the person who found Aladar. Alton Stone was clearly not telling investigators everything he knew. I think Alton was haunted by what happened that night. I'm not sure if he was haunted by something that he may have witnessed or haunted by guilt. Investigators pressed Stone about Lundy's involvement, but he claimed he didn't know what really happened that night. Mr. Stone had been questioned and asked about the events, and he had responded by making differing statements, all of which could not be true. Stone was not only uh, making false statements before the grand jury, but was in effect obstructing the underlying investigation that was going on. So, in January of 1998, U.S. attorneys indicted Alton Stone for perjury. To have someone charged this way in federal court is a very unusual event. This was a, an attempt by the government to pressure and, and leverage Mr. Stone. At his perjury trial, Stone still didn't crack. He was convicted and sentenced to five months in prison. Who knows? Maybe Lundy had gotten to Alton Stone. But the prosecutors weren't giving up. They headed back to Houston and came up with a new plan of attack. In March 1999, a federal grand jury indicted J.T. Lundy on charges of bank fraud in connection with First City Bank. When Lundy's trial began on January 19, 2000, he was confident. Lundy's defense was, was simple. That is, look, I'm a good old boy horse trader, and yes, I had some be business dealings with Frank Sheak on the side, but they didn't have anything to do with whether or not uh, the loan was made. The prosecution struggled to make a complicated case easy for the jury to understand. Among other things, they introduced evidence that Sheehack had received breeding rights worth $125,000 to a Calumet Stallion for $1. Proof, they argue, that Sheehack accepted bribes to loan the farm money. The prosecutors introduced Gary Matthews' September 1989 memorandum to JT as evidence. In pretty clear, concise King's English, Mr. Matthews suggests that because of Mr. Chiak's position in the bank, that Mr. Lundy might want to think about bribing him. The defense's counter-argument was strange, to say the least. They argued JT Lundy wasn't smart enough to perpetrate fraud and bribery. Lundy's defense strategy was, look, we were hoodwinked by Frank Chiak. JT Lundy is a nice man with good intentions. I also, I also think he's dumber than a bucket of hair. Confident of an acquittal, J.T. Lundy didn't take the stand. But when the jury retired on February 7, 2000, it took them less than two hours to reach a guilty verdict. The Fed's dogged pursuit of J.T. Lundy had paid off. It looked like he was on his way to prison, but on fraud charges, not for killing the champion horse. After he was convicted, he seemed very upbeat, like he expected that things were still going to work out and everything was going to be okay. When we return, J.T. Lundy gets a big surprise at his sentencing. In 
In a federal courtroom, J.T. Lundy awaited a judge's sentence on his conviction for bank fraud, bribery, and conspiracy. But prior to sentencing, Lundy's prosecutors announced that they weren't done with Lundy just yet. Prosecutors were thrilled they had nailed J.T. Lundy on the fraud charges, but were furious they didn't get the chance to pin Aladar's death on him. But when the sentencing phase of his trial came along, they cleverly found a way. U.S. attorneys have discretion to introduce testimony on the character of the convicted. Prosecutors plan to prove to the judge that not only was Lundy guilty of bank fraud, conspiracy, and bribery, he also murdered a legendary thoroughbred just for the insurance money. To make their case, the government introduced the results of the tests on Aladar's stall door as proof that the injury didn't happen the way Lundy claimed. They did a good job of showing that there were still a lot of questions to be answered regarding the circumstances around this horse's death, that there was some physical evidence that didn't match the story. Why do they want to kill him? They want the insurance money. It was Thirty-six and a half million dollars settled right off. It's a circumstantial case, is what it is. Um, but as we argued at sentencing, it's very compelling. And circumstantial evidence in the eyes of the law is as good as, if not better, than direct evidence. Prosecutors were confident painting him as a cold-blooded killer would get Lundy a longer sentence for the fraud. But the judge said that the prosecution hadn't met their burden of proof. He concluded that the circumstances were very suspicious. He concluded that where there was motive and opportunity. His public pronouncement from the bench uh, was that the circumstances surrounding the death of the horse were extremely suspicious, but he wasn't convinced to the level he needed to be convinced that uh, Mr. Lundy was responsible for the injury to the horse. Prosecutors were crushed. It seemed as if Lundy was sitting pretty. He had gotten off. Then came the shocking sentence. The judge gave Lundy four years in a federal penitentiary, over twice as much time as Gary Matthews, Calumet's former CFO, convicted along with Lundy on the same charges. JT was stunned by the sentence. He claimed that he was just shocked. When it came down to the sentencing, uh, suddenly things weren't okay. Today, J.T. Lundy lives far removed from the palatial grounds of Calumet Farm. He now resides at the federal prison camp in Pensacola, Florida. Because of the 10-year statute of limitations for insurance fraud, it is unlikely that further charges will ever be made against him. Aladar's death will remain a mystery. It's been as exhaustively investigated as probably any human murder case could be. It was that important. It was that uh, necessary to try to get the truth, but uh, I don't know if anybody will ever really know. As long as uh, there's a Lexington, as long as there's a K Met farm, there'll be people who believe that Lundy killed the horse for insurance money. And uh, when Tom Dixon passes on, his obituary will say, Tom Dixon, the adjuster for the suspicious loss of Ali Dar, died today of blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm convinced it'll be the first paragraph of my obituary. J.T. Lundy had gambled big. His greed nearly destroyed racing's most famous stable and perhaps killed one of its most beloved stars. He deserves to be where he is now, rotting in a federal prison. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.